This is Rich Collins, Director of Football Operations for the Southern California Collegiate Football Officials Association. And welcome to week five. And this is our fourth video we put out this year. We're getting a lot of compliments from our officials and coaches that are viewing these video messages. So I'd like to get on with the play. We had some interesting ones from week uh, four. And uh, Greg, why don't you share with everybody? Wanted to start off this week looking at a uh, fourth and short situation here, fourth and less than a yard, um, and kind of the uh, different nuances that a fourth down has for our game uh, here on Saturday. So first and foremost, we know that we are going to kill the clock um, at the end of this down. Um, it's either going to be a first down for Team A, or it's going to be a change of possession, and B is going to take over on downs if Team A is short of the line to gain. Uh, the other unique uh, situation that we have for our game on Saturday is what we refer to as the fourth down fumble rule um, that is uh, noted in Rule 7, Section 2, uh, Article 2, and then Exception Number 2 uh, within that uh, particular rule that states, on fourth down before a change of team possession, when a Team A fumble is caught or recovered by a Team A player other than the fumbler, the ball is dead. If the catcher recovery is beyond the spot of the fumble, the ball is returned to the spot of the fumble. If the catch or recovery is behind the spot of the fumble, the ball remains at the spot of the catch or recovery. So in order to really particularly rule on this play here, um, we kind of need to know what the definition of a fumble is. Um, in this particular case, uh, we actually do not have a fumble. Um, by definition and by rule, we have what is referred to as a muff. Um, if you look at Rule 2, Section 11, we've got a couple of definitions on a fumble and a muff. A fumble there is to fumble the ball is to lose player possession by any act other than passing, kicking, or successful handling. The status of the ball is a fumble. But in this particular case, because we didn't have player possession during this backwards pass or a snap, we have a muff. And the definition of a muff here is to muff a ball is to touch the ball in an unsuccessful attempt to catch or recover it. Muffing the ball doesn't change its status. And that really refers to impetus, which we'll probably get into um, in another video here. So ultimately, we do not have a fumble in this case. We have an unsuccessful attempt uh, to hand the ball off uh, from, the, from the snapper to the quarterback, and the quarterback muffs this ball. So essentially, any player on the field, uh, specifically for Team A, can pick this ball up and advance it um, on this fourth down. Uh, so something to kind of keep in mind uh, in using the right language between a muff and a fumble, uh, especially on a fourth down play, since we do have an exception to who can advance a fumble um, during fourth down. The other thing that we wanted to review that we talked about at the referee meeting on Sunday night um, are the mechanics of the flanks in this situation. And when we were talking about this and talking through it, uh, I think Dave Batista, one of our crew chiefs and a big sky replay official, um, kind of put it best. Uh, there are the two most important lines on the field are the goal line and the line to gain. And when either one of these lines is threatened, we want to make sure that we are crashing in to help sell this call. Again, it's going to be a first down for someone here. Um, we really like the mechanics of the flank official at the top of the screen uh, coming in, killing the clock, crashing in to help rule on this play. But the mechanics of, for the flank official at the bottom of the screen, we'd like to see you crashing in uh, a little bit harder to help sell this, especially with regards to forward progress. As an umpire, more than likely, I'm probably going to pass the ball uh, to one of these flank officials and ask them to spot it. Um, referee and umpire, we are not going to have a, a good look at this with regards to depth and whether or not the line to gain was made. So we're really relying on both flank officials. Uh, flanks, get in there. We'd like to hand you the ball, have you spot it. Referee, go up and take a look. Uh, on whether or not this is going to be a first down or if it's close enough that we are going to do a measurement here. Um, so again, a lot going on in this uh, short play, uh, but uh, very important with regards to uh, rules and mechanics.
Our next couple of clips are going to uh, focus on targeting. And so before we get into the clips themselves, wanted to go over a bit of a targeting overview. Um, again, this is not necessarily uh, the end all be all of a targeting checklist, uh, just something that I've put together a couple of years back and have shared. We shared this at Jeff Applebaum's meeting uh, this last week and it was pretty well received by the officials there. So I wanted to go through just a little bit of, a, uh, um, of an overview of targeting. Uh, so there are two targeting rules in our NCAA rulebook, 913 and 914. Uh, you'll hear some officials actually use 913 and 914, uh, specifically there on the field. But 913 um, has to do with making forcible contact with the crown of the helmet and 914 making forcible contact to the head or neck area of a defenseless player. The checklist that I like to use on the field, the first question that I ask myself or any of our officials uh, that have targeting uh, or a member of my crew rather uh, was the player defenseless and uh, if the player was defenseless um, we have definitions specifically in 914 and 227 14. not going to go through all of these uh, right now in the essence of time uh, but certainly take a look at them this list is uh, not necessarily exclusive either but just you know uh, about a dozen or so examples uh, of when a player is defenseless. So if a player is defenseless and meets one of these criteria, um, the contact does not need to be made with the crown of the helmet. Again, 914 specifically states that no player shall target and make forcible contact to the head or neck area of a defenseless opponent with the helmet, the forearm, the hand, the fist, the elbow, or the shoulder. So forcible contact to the head or neck area can be made with any part um, of the body there, and we would have targeting if the player was defenseless. The foul also requires that there be at least one indicator, uh, which we'll get to here in a little bit as well. But if the player was not defenseless, if the player does not meet any of the criteria as a defenseless player, then targeting can only be called if there is contact with the crown of the helmet which NCAA defined for us uh, last year as the circular area or a six inch radius from the apex or the top of the helmet. So again, 913 specific to forcible contact with the crown. 914 specific or specifically referring to contact with a, a defenseless player and forcible contact to the head or neck area. And then as we mentioned as well, there needs to be an indicator. And those indicators are noted in 914, where we have a launch, a crouch, leading, or lowering the head. So again, if we were to go through that checklist, is the player defenseless? Yes, the player was defenseless. We have forcible contact to the head or neck area with the shoulder of the defensive player. Great, now what is the indicator? Were they leading with the helmet, shoulder, forearm, etc., lowering the head, launching? Is the player defenseless? No, the player is not defenseless. Then contact needs to be made with the crown of the helmet and that six inch apex. So we're gonna look at just a couple of examples uh, from Steve Shaw's national video, and then look at a couple examples of targeting that were overturned by Rich and our commissioner this last week. So here's an example from uh, the CFO preseason training tape on targeting. And uh, we're gonna look at the action on the receiver that's gonna be towards the bottom of the screen and essentially go through our checklist. Uh, so is this player defenseless? Uh, in this particular case, uh, yes, a uh, receiver that was attempting to make a, a complete a catch, uh, and that catch was not completed uh, in a vulnerable position there. So the receiver is defenseless. Uh, was forcible contact made uh, to the head or neck area? Uh, yes. And uh, then is there an indicator here? Uh, yes, we have leading with the head in this particular case. So again, defenseless player, forcible contact to the head or neck area, and our indicator of leading, uh, we have a targeting call here that was upheld on the field. Again, we understand that we're looking at this, you know, frame by frame, and we've got eight different angles that we're looking through here, but we wanted to show some examples uh, of targeting that was upheld on the field. 
Uh, so here's another example here. We're going to be watching the action on the quarterback or the runner. Um, and in this particular case, uh, this runner uh, is not defenseless. Uh, you're going to see this again here in a couple of other uh, couple of other angles. Uh, but ultimately, targeting was called on the field. Uh, this goes to automatic review uh, in Division One. But as you can see here in slow motion, when they slow it down, uh, this quarterback or runner is still going north or south, uh, trying to get into the end zone. So we do not have a defenseless player here. Uh, now we know that contact needs to be made with the crown of the helmet. Um, and I think there's a better angle here coming up uh, where we do not see that uh, the uh, contact was with the crown of the helmet. So this particular call on the field for targeting uh, was overturned. We do not have a defenseless player and we did not have contact uh, with the crown of the helmet. And so here's an example of a targeting that was overturned uh, this last weekend. And pay attention to the action at the top of the screen there. So let's just go through our checklist that we just reviewed. Uh, is this player defenseless? Uh, yes, I think that we would all agree that uh, the ball is on the ground here. Uh, we have an unsuccessful attempt to catch a pass and that this player cannot reasonably protect themselves. Um, is there, so if we have a defenseless player, uh, the contact does not need to be made with the crown, but do we have forcible contact to the head or neck area? And for that, I'll kind of slow this down a little bit. Um, so we've got ball on the ground there. And then that initial contact looks to be, you know, with the shoulder. Um, again, you know, shoulder to about the chest area and coming through. I, we did not have forcible contact to the head or neck area in this case. Again, we're looking at a, a piece of film filmed 40 yards away and from 25, 30 yards in the air. Uh, but overall, we have contact really to the shoulder, uh, in this case of the defenseless player, shoulder to shoulder, and then going down. So we don't have forcible contact to the head or neck area, but do we even have an indicator as well uh, if we keep going through the checklist? Um, we don't have lowering the head, we don't have crouching, we don't have really a launch necessarily. So again, in going through that checklist, if we're unsure of any of those three items that are required for targeting, we do not have targeting. However, in this particular case, we would certainly support a personal foul uh, for a late hit on this receiver, uh, 15 yards. Uh, so again, keeping in mind that you do have personal foul buckets, uh, that if there is a foul uh, that fits into one of those buckets, absolutely please call that. But in this case, walking through our checklist, we do not have targeting. Here's another example of a targeting that was overturned uh, this last week. Um, pay attention to the action here on the quarterback. Uh, quarterback is going to become a runner. Um, and there are very few circumstances in which a runner is uh, not considered or considered a defenseless player. So make sure that you review uh, those defenseless player definitions uh, and examples there. But again, we've got a quarterback here that is a runner um, and in very few circumstances can be defenseless. So I think we would all agree if we go through our checklist here, um, is this player defenseless? No, this runner is still trying to advance north-south on this field um, and is not wrapped up, is not going backwards. Um, can reasonably defend himself, so we do not have a defenseless player here. Therefore, we need contact to be with the crown of the helmet. And, of course, slowing this down, looking at it frame by frame or even in real time, this uh, looks bad. It sounds bad. Uh, fans, sideline, coaches, they're all going to go nuts with a big hit on the quarterback where his helmet comes off. But this is not a foul. Um, as Jeff Applebaum put it in talking with him this, this last week, you know, basketball has really become a contact sport. Football is now a collision sport. Um, and when these runners, you know, try to continue to advance north and south, these defenders still do have the privilege of trying to tackle them and get them down to the ground. Again, helmet coming off of a quarterback looks bad, sounds bad. It's right in front of that sideline. Um, but it's not necessarily a foul. So um, in this particular case, we've actually got nothing here. No personal foul, especially no personal foul for targeting uh, if we go through that checklist. And the final one that we're going to take a look at this week is actually very close. And we're going to focus on the action of the quarterback once here again. Um, and this quarterback uh, decides to become a runner. 
and decides to give himself up there at about the uh, 43 yard line, 43, 44 yard line. And in talking about this with the San Fernando Valley group uh, this last Tuesday night and appreciate all your thoughts and everybody getting involved in the conversation. Again, we're looking at this film from 40 yards away, 25, 30 yards um, off the uh, off the field uh, and ground level. We, we certainly know as officials this game is fast, this game is big, um, and we have to make decisions you know, relatively quickly uh, here on the field. But again, that's why we want to walk through our checklist of targeting. So in this particular case, do we have a defenseless player? Uh, my answer, our answer, you know, would be yes. This is a very late slide by the quarterback, um, but still defenseless ultimately. Um, but because it's a late slide, he really does kind of lose that protection. This defender right here is really kind of already committed, you know, to the tackle. When the quarterback does decide to slide, you see the defender already coming down. And then unfortunately, we've got that player 98, you know, there in the way where we really don't see if the initial contact is forcible and to the head or neck area of a defenseless player. Uh, so I, I think that we did decide to uphold this targeting call um, because this player was in the way, you know, as we slow it down frame by frame. Uh, but we really need to know that we had forcible contact to the head or neck area. Uh, don't think that we had forcible contact to the head or neck area, and then some sort of an indicator. In this particular case, I guess uh, some, you know, uh, uh, an argument can be made for a launch, but this defender is really going down and making a tackle, maybe leading you know, with the forearm area there, but we really don't know where the initial contact was made, if it was to the chest, and that's what made the head you know, snap back there. Uh, but again, the only other thing that we talked about during this is that, you know, any type of late action on a sliding quarterback, um, you're going to have some pretty upset offensive linemen. Officials uh, get in there. We see the umpire, you know, kind of run up. The you know, umpire has a flag. The flank has a flag. Um, and then the umpire, you turn, you know, back to the, uh, the referee. Um, flank, you kind of stop at about the numbers, actually, you know, a little bit towards the numbers there. We really want to get in there, use our voices, uh, make sure that these players do separate uh, and certainly don't turn our backs, you know, to this action uh, to go talk to the referee. The clock has stopped. Uh, we are in no hurry whatsoever to make sure that we get this right and get all of these players separated because you can see the offensive linemen kind of coming in, you know, and, uh, and pushing that defensive player a little bit. Uh, somebody else coming in, giving him a little bit of a shoulder there. We just want to make sure. And then he's got the defensive player has another teammate coming in to help him out. We just want to make sure that we separate all these players here. And that's going to do it for this week. Uh, I want to appreciate everybody tuning in and listening and watching this week. Uh, just a reminder, October 7th next week we, is a buy for SEC FOA. Uh, so we're going to take a week off from these bulletins and get back before uh, week six there. So have a great week five, everybody. Uh, be safe, slow whistles, and call what you see.